Thank you for braving London weather and infrastructure for the occasion this evening, an opportunity for us to welcome back to the school uh, Ben Van Berkel, someone I think you all know well, that the school knows well, and in fact a school that Ben knows extremely well. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, Ben and his partner Caroline Boss established uh, Ben Berkel Boss, an architectural office initially in Amsterdam, um, that today and in, in every sense imaginable, a truly worldwide uh, international practice of architecture. Um, the year after Ben graduated from this school, he established his office um, and uh, has undertaken a catalog of projects since then that's probably unrivaled amongst uh, his many peers in his generation across nearly not only every building type but every infrastructural type imaginable. A, catalog of projects that you know that includes the Erasmus Bridge in Rotterdam, the Mobius House, um, the Arnhem Station, which the office worked on for many, many years uh, in many different scales and forms to realize it in the form that you know it today, and more recently the Mercedes-Benz Museum, taking on an established, distinguished European building type of the museum in an extraordinary new and unexpected way uh, at the end of the 20th century. In 1998, Ben and Caroline relaunched the office uh, in the form that it's titled and known as today, UN Studio, um, United Net, um, and in fact invoked the idea of networks not just in the theoretical or philosophical ways that architects in the 1990s were extremely interested to engage such a term, but of course in the very organization of how they work and think as architects, as a network of uh, remarkable specialists and experts in many different fields that bridge from infrastructure to building design to urban expansion to product design, uh, working not just in Amsterdam but increasingly in uh, cities uh, and indeed in offices within the UN studio around the world. Um, ben uh, is absolutely at the forefront of a practice um, that a few years ago was referred to as diagrammatic architecture the diagrammatic generation that came of age in the 1990s alongside not just new computational and distributed network realities within the studio, but also an increasingly globalized practice of architectural culture uh, and has been at the leading edge of that generation's not only thinking, but work on the problems and the challenges associated with that. Uh, it's been a few years since Ben has stood at this lectern to give a lecture. It's an absolute pleasure always to invite him back. For many years he taught in this school. Uh, as I've already said, he studied in this school. For five years in a row we had him every June as an external examiner and I promise you we'll get him back very soon as a part of that um, routine. Recent publications include in 2010 a, a book titled Small Stuff, uh, gathering together the smaller scale projects, uh, installations, exhibitions, product designs of UN Studio few years before that, a fantastic monograph that I'm sure many of you know um, with the fantastic title of Buy Me a Mercedes Benz, which I keep waiting for that car to arrive, uh, which in fact documents the forms of expertise that UN Studio deployed on that building project over several years. Um, before that, in 1999, a great two-volume set titled Move, which was the office's first attempt to summarize in monograph form what now is 25 years of design experimentation. <coughs> in 1999, when Ben released MOVE, there was a quote in it that was the following, um, architects will be the fashion designers of the future. Um, a premonition, let's say, for what's happened not just in global but architectural culture over the last 10 years. At exactly that same moment, the great surrealist uh, British eccentric J.G. Ballard wrote that Modern architecture was maybe the Gothic style of the information age, and in fact, he was quite sure architecture would enter into a new realm, um, a new and unexpected realm, and I think UN Studio and Ben's work is an example of that today. Please join me in welcoming Ben back to the school. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, it's it's always uh, very comfortable to come back here. Uh, you you can imagine that um, 
with the one hand it is comfortable, on the other hand you feel always a bit uh, still uh, uh, a student when you come to this place because uh, I remember all the details of this room so well. So um, you can imagine how doubled it is to, to stand here. Uh, what I do, uh, what I will do tonight is that I, I will uh, not, uh, I would not go through the projects in detail. I would like to more talk about the development of the practice and the development of the way how um, maybe the discipline and the practice uh, always have had uh, a dialogue with each other, and how through the work, as we believe, it is so important to keep on setting up that dialogue with the practice and the profession. So, so, so for that reason, you see here, you in studio uh, upside down, uh, we reflect on ourselves, we, we think ourselves constantly. Uh, we have always believed that if you know how to design a, a project well, and probably uh, if you uh, can make time to think about yourself and organize yourself well, and organize, organize your practice also well, and probably you would have uh, much more time for design. So, so this, this collaborative belief that, that together what we have in the studio is all to do with, with why we produce and how we produce. And for that reason, maybe also the title uh, of, of this lecture is called Mo Motion Matters. Uh, you might not think that motion matters for you, but for me it matters a lot. Um, in the sense of that you can have, of, of course, a physical motion. You could have an imaginative motion whenever you think about projects, uh, but you can also think of motion in the way how it encapsulates the way how we can think about the past, the present, and the future, um, in the way how you develop, uh, within the way how you operate as an architect uh, in, 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 uh, in motion. Um, but let me, let me talk about the, 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 the way how we started. Uh, as uh, Brett introduced, we, we were, of course, interested in this idea of the, the network uh, practice, and, and that, was, uh, that was in the 90s, we, we, the late 90s. We, we, we used uh, diagrammatic and, and design model strategies to think about the way how we could collaborate, and, and, and maybe recently with the pro prototype thinking, uh, maybe you know that we have done so many prototypes, uh, and, and often the pavilions are the prototypes uh, in our work, or maybe the furniture and the products, uh, we, we, the product design we do, are prototypes. But, but lately, um, what, what we find the most important is to think about the way how we can start to rethink the way how could be uh, grouped in all in, in, in one unit, sorry, in one platform. So the community platforms, as we call them, uh, collaborate on a project, they, they, they negotiate with each other uh, on the way how we produce a project, but in the same time they collect the knowledge, not so much within the office itself, but also uh, how we now online collect that knowledge as well. And that's that we don't believe in a co-creative uh, world alone where everyone can design, we are more or less uh, promoting the idea of exchanging knowledge online and within the organization of the studio simply because we uh, know that, that, that by that we can gather the knowledge we cannot otherwise gain within the office itself or in the, in the practice itself. Um, for that reason also we, of course, 
uh, then uh, uh, set up dialogues with other disciplines. Um, so you have to imagine that, that before we used to uh, invent sometimes two or three things at different floors uh, within the organization, but now today, since we have, or uh, uh, sorry, or internal specialists, we, we educate ourselves to be uh, a specialist and develop an exp expertise within each group, each platform. So that means whenever someone comes in the practice, then you're not simply an architect anymore. You're, you're not coming in as an architect. You, you will be trained uh, and you will be asked, even if you come into the office, to, to develop a specialism. And with that specialism, you, you might develop uh, among the time when you are maybe for one year or two years interested in sustainability, you might move to, towards the smart material group or you might move over to the innovative uh, program uh, 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 platform. So you might, over the time, uh, grow in a circle of learning within the way how you would like to uh, place yourself within the uh, 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 practice. And the reason is simply because I've learned that, that in the way how we uh, 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 produce our projects, that, that with this, the expansion of depression has been far more further expanded than, than we ever could imagine even 10 years ago. If you think in the way how we thought maybe only a century ago about aesthetics and functionality alone, I mean, that model is now totally changed in the world of science, whereby on the one hand we work with utility systems and highly complex uh, 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 technological innovation on the one hand, and on the other hand we can refer so easily to many cultural uh, qualities within the field. As we know, you can um, today in architecture refer to almost everything you, one likes, from literature to, 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 uh, to, um, to fashion, to, to uh, philosophy, etc. So, so what I'm saying is that this expansion of the profession has been so elongated, it's so much more kind of further stretched up that it becomes far more interesting to gain all this knowledge within the way how this stretching up and, and all the regulations and, 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 and the, the, the systems around it, how you can capture that all into one system and find new working models for that uh, is the key for the, the way how we can develop new concepts of control of the way how we uh, uh, produce or work. So if we work with consultants or inform ourselves or get others involved, the, 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 the level of participation becomes far more important. And, and where I maybe in a way like to go back to is, uh, and, and, and maybe that's uh, also what I'd like to set up as a dialogue for tonight, is, is, is to go back in time and think about the time when, when scientists, artists would talk about literature, science, and, and, and he, art history, etc. Because um, in that classical uh, cafe or that salon, uh, maybe in Paris or Vienna, in this case this is Vienna, where uh, Sigmund Freud would uh, have an, uh, a, a dialogue with um, Klimt or uh, Egon Schiele and they would talk about uh, um, a science in this case. For instance, you can see here a scientist holding up uh, an, an, a drawing of, of a molecular uh, uh, discovery they just had discovered and Klimt, as maybe you can recognize that Klimt used some of his patterns uh, in his paintings referring to these molecular uh, structures. Uh, what we often didn't, you know, if you go back to art history, that is often not really recognized that these artists were so influenced by the sciences of the time. When Freud developed a theory around women, then uh, Koska and, and Klimt were totally against it because they said, yeah, but how could you know so much about women? Because you know you don't you don't uh, really uh, paint them so as we do. We are so much with them involved. You have a theory. We 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 uh, we are closer to them as artists than than the, you as an uh, as a thinker with your theories. So there was a constant dialogue there. But but if we think about this local um, dialogue, uh, uh, scientists and artists uh, would would have with e each other. Uh, what is today so interesting is that we can today in a f be in a far more global salon and we can get that information from far more different corners of the world almost instantly 
every day if we'd like. We can com communicate with the academic world. We, com com uh, we can communicate with artists, uh, not only where you're friends with around the corner, but uh, in many different parts of our, um, our process of the way of, uh, of how we'd like to gather and gain information. So, so this fascination for, for that, that time and maybe the way also how in that time, <coughs> uh, and I'm talking again about the, the, the beginning of uh, the last century in Vienna, how certain artists were fascinated in, in the way how certain gestures could, could, could uh, develop a particular kind of social code, uh, like for instance in the paintings of Akon Schiele. As we know, uh, Akon Schiele was not so interested in when he was uh, presenting portraits to, to draw a classical portrait. For him, the hands were far more saying anything of a social code than, let's say, to be found in the, in the, in, in the, in the face. So this idea of how a large detail within the structure of the portrait can say more, much more than the portrait itself, uh, is something what, what started to fascinate me when I read, read uh, read such an interesting book on the history of this uh, dialogue scientists and artists had and how they reanalyzed each other's work. And, and if, I, if, I, if I think about the work and, and our own work over the last years, then, then maybe this interest in the larger detail or the three or four singular details who can do the work in, in, the, in the projects has been for us very, very key, very important. So like Maybe this, this latest uh, furniture, it's a, a simple, uh, what we call a sit table. You can sit in the table, uh, but you can sit around the table. It's often, uh, lately, luckily enough, bought by startup companies. They like it because it's only one furniture. You don't have to buy six furniture. You can work in the table, you can lunch on the table, you can have, a, you can have three or four dialogues within the table, you can, you can have different teams working on the table, etc. So, so often this piece is more seen as an architectural object and move from one space to another instead of uh, that you have to, again, uh, buy uh, several uh, 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 furniture. And, and similarly, like with, with uh, not only the furniture but the pavilions, what we have learned is that <coughs> talking about the larger detail and the larger elements within the work, we have used these elements as, as prototypes, as I said, as, as prototypes of, of theoretical uh, models. Uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, then later on we started to call it design models, but these theoretical models, they, they gave us insights in the way how certain uh, aspects of the production of the work could be reverse engineered back towards the architecture. And, and, and this idea of reverse engineering uh, from, from the way how we produce work towards the way how it can be brought back towards the design was for us a totally new insight in a way how we could get away from the linear way of thinking of, of design. And that's why maybe I talk about uh, here today as well that, that, that we know now today we don't have to operate in linear models anymore. Today clients, uh, they, they, they are asking us sometimes or they have requests for producing stuff but what you normally would produce in three months' time, but now you have to produce in one week time. So new forms of quickness, gathering information, dense information in a very short time, or in a new way of uh, uh, bringing that together is, is uh, all in, 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 um, in request. In this case, the, 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 the larger detail is a window uh, and a construction element in the same time. It's a pavilion in uh, Chicago where um, in a public square, we made this new public space, you could say, within the public square, uh, whereby uh, these diagonal views are connected to the ben Burnham plan, whereby the, the diagonal uh, 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 angles within the city, the diagonal uh, um, avenues, are playing a similar kind of, uh, here in a sectional uh, role, uh, and play with the, uh, with the city. And, and with this idea, we wanted to create a new kind of public construct within the square itself. <coughs> the, the, the square or the public uh, millennium square is quite large. We want to create with that small events to, to, uh, uh, to be activated uh, there with this uh, pavilion here, not only during the day, but also by the night. And, and these events, these public constructs, 
they happened by nature, uh, 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 almost with the way how the light was introduced in the pavilion as well. Or another large detail is this ceiling for, from an earlier project we uh, produced uh, so in the, in the mid-90s for a museum called the Falkhof Museum in Nijmegen. The ceiling is, is the only element, uh, together with the uh, central staircase, but brings you up the, the gallery space, uh, what you can see here, and it gives a view to an old Roman wall. Maybe you didn't know that the Romans were in Holland, but they were once in Holland. Um, and and f with this view towards the, this, this ruin, it plays also a role with the, the history of what is presented in the museum, where you can all find archaeological objects to be connected to that view of the uh, 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 Roman wall on the gallery side. But, but the ceiling is guiding you, it's, it's directing you, it's, it's, uh, it's a play within a way how it reflects and mirrors the topological uh, landscape, what is quite unusual uh, again in Holland to, to find, because in Holland we are happy with every little meter uh, height, um, but it's reflected uh, in the ceiling. <laughs> and you can see how, how the play between the exhibition and the, and the ceiling plays a role towards the landscape uh, and the view of the landscape as well. And this is the central staircase, whereby a staircase, in a staircase, within a staircase is introduced to, to guide the public, again, in a public construct, moving from one program to the other. So without any wayfinding element, the stair, or the stair within a stair, uh, guides you within the way how you move around the project. And again, these two elements, they, they make the project, they, they, they hold the project together. Uh, this stair is also the column and the stabilizer of the whole building and the cantilever of the of, of the roof. And 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 further, I would like to explain that that these principles of the larger detail, who can express something more than only what what you see in form or in, in the way how maybe the production of the form came together here, is 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 to be found in in the way how we have uh, worked on it. Like the bridge is in Rotterdam is not at all referring to its, its kind of uh, reference it always gets, like one calls it a swan or a, a kneeling person, or there are many names have been given to the, the, the bridge. But for us it was a reference to the cranes in the harbor of Rotterdam and, uh, and the robustness of uh, the, the harbor and, and the way how that industrial history had a, um, had so much uh, uh, um, to do with the, this, uh, this innovative city, uh, a city that was so heavily bombed and uh, so heavily uh, uh, ruined, uh, it needed an incredible amount of optimism to, to be pulled out of that history. And, and of course it was a bridge to, uh, to be uh, linked to the new development on the south of uh, Rotterdam and pulled in a way the, the city centre towards the south in, in, a, in, an, uh, in, in a gesture, as you can see. But, but these double readings, these double understandings, or the double histories you can find in the, in the readings of the bridge, were also to be mirrored and reflected in the colour of the bridge, as we, we used them kind of call it baby blue colour. Um, the the, the, the colour constantly absorbed the skies and the light of the surroundings. Uh, by, by sometimes the bridge would disappear in its surroundings uh, or in its grey skies and sometimes would light up with a uh, lot of uh, daylight coming to the bridge. And similarly, uh, with, with, with these kind of material effects we constantly played with in the way how uh, we want to, of course, experiment with the materials, but in the same time wanted to find ways to, to uh, refer it back to the reading of a, a portrait of that what's, what was happening in the building. Like uh, th this uh, villa, Villa NM, uh, uh, a project uh, uh, built uh, in uh, upstate New York, uh, played with that role of, of gold, and, and, and maybe because it was a Russian client, uh, was quite interested in gold. Um, we played a kind of game with its idea of the, the special constant reflection of, of not only the gold, but the reflection of the class uh, referring to the landscape around the uh, uh, site. As you can see, if you look into the window, you see that reflectiveness coming back around, for instance, a simple element like the fireplace. But, but the most important is that, that this double reading and this understanding of the use of, of the material effects also play with the idea of 
what we call an after image. An image what is not giving you a direct image, a direct understanding. Uh, the idea is here that you, uh, like with the bridge, that you would, would see the project, you would experience the project, and that you would have, with this experience, that you would have to come back to it to understand it. Um, and, and, to, to, and hopefully uh, 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 that you would come back even more to the project. And, and of course, as we know, if we, we have read an interesting uh, book or we have found an interesting painting and, and we are fascinated by it ourselves, then we'd like to come back to it as well. So this kind of idea of the way how one can create afterthoughts was for us the most important in the way how we brought these ideas together. <clears throat> Similarly, like, like in how, for instance, the Möbius house, whereby two materials did the whole work uh, uh, of bringing the glass in and out and the concrete in the same time, bringing the concrete in and out, had to do with the way how the play between inside and outside was constantly challenged. Like, for instance, the, the, the glass moves uh, as a facade towards an inside facade, so you can see that here. This is an inside facade. and. Uh, this was a dialogue uh, I had with the client uh, because they wanted to always make sure, uh, and you see, you don't see the furniture in here and the whole interior, but you have to imagine it a little bit. They didn't want to uh, present the uh, interior in uh, full scope. Um, but they, they were always fascinated to know that whenever the children would come home that they would see them. It's strange enough. Um, but, but that was the idea of constantly playing with this inside and outside, the dialogue between the family and how they would gather and how the loop of living, working and sleeping in the Möbius structure would be uh, 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 creating a kind of endless uh, quality of experiences with people all, who already in the, in the early 90s decided to work at home. So, so maybe that, that two material effect is maybe also about the dual reading, the dual reading of the way how maybe a grid structure might open up and then create a condition whereby it starts to set up a dialogue between a landscape feature where maybe in a particular time of the year this tree might be green and then sets up a kind of short dialogue with, with the building. And, and, and uh, for a laboratorium building like this, that here that it was necessary to have a closed building was highly necessary because the, 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 this particular research uh, didn't allow the daylight to come in, only there where the public spaces were uh, be introduced in the central part of the building. And here, the idea was that, that where the scientists would move, they would all be able here to gather and, and, and talk to each other and hopefully uh, share their, their latest uh, discoveries within the research they were after. So, so this stair and the connection with all the spaces around the stair were there to create a kind of form of social sustainability. This, this is also what we further expanded in so many buildings uh, uh, later on. We hide our elevators. We, you can't find them in our buildings lately. <laughs> Uh, you have to discover the elevators in order, be, in order to make sure that, that you have to take the staircase, especially in, in, in the work environment where people then hopefully take more the stair. Or in another project, uh, in the latest uh, house we are close to finishing in, um, in Holland, in Bergen on Zee. Uh, it's a very, very nice location. It's close to the sea. <clears throat> uh, the, the intertwining, maybe in reference here, almost directly, literally, towards the hands of Schiele, are he intertwined and, and opening slightly up in order to bring some daylight in, in some of the sub uh, rooms in, in the house. But, but if I talk about this idea of the control and the, and the way how we can develop new forms of concepts of control in the way how we, how we bring our major elements together, in, 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 in the way how we, how, we, how we design and how we bring architecture together and, and that particularly ideas, then the, of course one of the most important latest elements is the, the void space and we, and we talk a lot about the management or the managing the void in a way. Um, and maybe this is one of our most uh, important examples whereby if you enter the Mercedes-Benz uh, Museum, uh, what happens is almost like if you yeah, you enter almost a dream. It's it's like if if you are driving around the space and the car 
stand still, but, but you sometimes don't know if the car is driving or you are driving. So you, you, you are in many spaces in the same time, in many times at the same time. Um, and this kaleidoscopic effect of this kind of double reading of the void uh, was then introduced to uh, make an, an, an experience whereby you constantly would be able to, to view the other part of the public who would be another cycle, another route, uh, who would be in another route on, uh, in the building. And you can see that here much better. If you look up, you can't really see what is exactly happening in the project. But if you walk down, then you can suddenly, suddenly discover uh, what is uh, happening within the project. Then suddenly the program opens itself up uh, towards you. But, but the way how the deep texture of this void connects itself uh, here to many uh, aspects, so the program, but also the light, how the light in the second layer comes in, or how, let's say, what I said about the public constructs within the organization of the project we made, are to be found on many layers and many depths, is what, what was here the key in the way how we thought about the, the way how we could bring uh, the public together uh, in this project. And, and maybe as you all know, that the two spirals, when you walk down, you take an elevator, you come up, and then you can walk, this is an unfolded section actually, so you can uh, take this, this route, but you can always step over to the second route, and you can step down from, from this route to uh, the second uh, stepped up route uh, when you walk uh, down. But you can imagine with the complexity and the richness in the same time of the way how one moves down in this, uh, in this, in this double spiral organization that you'd never know if you have been in a certain space. Sometimes you like to go back, sometimes you wonder if you have to go back or if you have to come another time back. Um, and, and this texture of the void is then also projected towards the outside. So as, as what is an, um, for us a quite an unusual uh, way of uh, here working and what we recently repeat so often is that we, that we play with these internal textures and then pull them towards the outside. So there are many references we uh, uh, bring into the way how the context is brought into the building. Like if you enter Stuttgart, you might drive in a spiral down into the bowl of the city and that, that whole idea that you come from a higher level into the city uh, then to the lower part of the city is similarly expressed in this project. But, but the way how the facade here comes together is not at all having a literal reference to the context. It is more an expression of the texture to, from, uh, from the inside towards uh, the outside. And with this experiment, uh, during the process of bringing this project together, we constantly discovered new ideas, whereby the glass was suddenly almost going underneath your feet and you would have a view uh, down towards the highway, turning around the, uh, uh, the museum, where as almost you experience as if the cars can drive into the building. So managing the control of construction, program, infrastructure, the way how the, the light is treated, the way how, let's say, the context is brought into the, this, this notion of the absence of what you cannot find in the void, is something that you slowly discover when you are into the building. And this notion of absence is maybe the key of what, what is maybe uh, that, that's what, what we wanted to experience uh, and, and uh, wanted to bring into this project. Uh, because because it, it is, of course, today very difficult to display uh, uh, cars in a museum. What is a car? I mean, do we want to um, see it as an... As an as an industrial product, like we know from the helicopter in the MoMA, what is hanging in the lobby, um, is it an is it is it a cultural object? Is it an is it so that that a car can be seen as a museum as a, well as an as a product for a, of a museum, as we know of other museums, uh, etc. So that double question is constantly uh, asked within the way how you experience the building. But but that void space <coughs> and the and the play of that void space, we, we have now recently brought also into our, our urban uh, uh, strategies, like um, for instance, uh, Singapore, uh, a city where we lately do quite a lot of work, is, is a city of, 
incredible, interesting regulations, new forms of infrastructural strategies, a city that is, for me, the most beautiful landscape city as we know. Uh, um, the, the landscape is uh, part of the planning process brought into the sites around the buildings, but you, as the planning department argues for, they want to bring it also into the buildings as well. Well, here you see a study of a, of a residential project we uh, uh, recently finished, whereby the views of the tower are connected to the way how they can be spread of the different heights within the project, and how the voids in this case, with all the voids you can find within the city, because because each building is almost having an uh, an own kind of uh, identity and, and almost no link within the way how they match up within the organization of the city but they link up often more with the landscape, and that's where we, in a way, refer to as well. So, so if, if the openness and the transparency is introduced on the lower level of the project, then it's all done in order to bring the landscape within the project. And, and if one wants to understand the intertwining of the windows and the, and the service of the, of the facade towards the way how the project is organized, then one, one needs to really uh, understand this in the reference to it's the way how the landscape is almost brought into the texture here of the of the building. But what we did was to make sure that that with these views and these panoramas we were gaining, and you have to understand that. That, that there where we have um, <coughs> open views, you have almost no direct sunlight coming in, so the sun is going over the building like this, for that reason that we closed down the headings of the two sides of the building. So here the, the, the most important heat of the building is coming towards this side, and for that reason, for many sustainable reasons, we wanted to close this part of the building. But this part we totally opened up, so all the, all the weight and all the constructive elements are to be found on the side of these, of these uh, uh, elements. There is no construction in the middle to be found. But another thing is, is that we played around with uh, open spaces. So, so especially after a particular time of the day, uh, in certain parts of the year, one can open up uh, the, the living rooms or the windows and then wind would uh, cross-ventilate the whole apartment uh, from from both sides of the uh, of the location. For that reason, uh, on, on, uh, here is a double height balcony introduced, and you can see that here as well, in order to bring that that airflow as we studied uh, intensely into the building. And, and that articulation of the site and the closed part of the facade, of course, uh, similarly is introduced in the way how the, 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 the angles and the articulation of the, the, the apartments come together in the front as well. And you can maybe better see here also how these double high balconies uh, work. So, so with all the heat and the openings uh, to create that, that that uh, transparency on the one hand, and also that closeness on the other hand, uh, privacy uh, as well, but was uh, a, a way of how we treated further the second layer of the texture of the facade. So there is a first layer, and then here's the second layer, and even a third layer. The most important is to understand that there are these different, there are only two types, but we mirrored them several times. So you have, of course, as you could see in the facade, you have these, these types who are then creating these double height uh, balconies, but in the same time we mirror them on the back of the building. So this is only uh, one series of types uh, and then uh, on the other side of the building mirrored back, so as you can see here. But maybe better to be seen in this image, you can see here that the, the most important core elements and the construction elements are to be found in the center of the project. And then here the openness where the panorama needed to be happening there where you have the living space is introduced in the front of the building. Major uh, living uh, spaces like uh, bedroom areas uh, and the infrastructures uh, introduced along this axis. And you can always walk around uh, in this circular movement uh, around the apartment. 
And the corners are always left open and, and kept transparent, so that you would always have this direct relationship with, uh, with the uh, surroundings. But going back to, to reverse engineering and, and the idea of the production of a project like this, one might think it is highly complex, but, but it will only use uh, 16 different or 17 uh, different elements. And these elements were mirrored uh, uh, in many directions. So sometimes they were mirrored, they were uh, turned in an order to, to make the project uh, feasible and buildable and, and, and to make it in a way so disciplined that we could build it in a quite uh, uh, compact uh, period of only one and a half year uh, time. And here's maybe the best, as you can see, this kind of dialogue between maybe where the void almost disappears sometimes in the night and the dialogue between the city and the apartment creates a kind of very, uh, very uh, clear di dialogue. But these principles uh, of, of maybe there where we, we learn from the housing projects are also used in, in, for instance, lately in affordable housing. This is a project in, uh, in, um, in Korea, whereby in a similar way, the, 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 the mirroring and the, and the, the repeti repetitive uh, discipline of certain prefab elements were used in order to use, in this case, only six elements uh, uh, to play with in order to create constant different identities within a whole series of uh, residential projects uh, to be built on this uh, project. And played with the landscape, an, an, a new, uh, yeah, especially in Korea, where you know a lot of uh, residential buildings have only one identity, maybe with a number uh, you can, uh, can uh, find on the building. We, with the landscape, we wanted uh, to create a new form of an identity whereby the, the, the roads would have their own trees related to the way how you would be able to point at your own building and recognize your own building within the environment. But, but as maybe um, this idea of uh, what I earlier mentioned, uh, of how, how we like to bring these public constructs together and how we play with this idea of duration and, and what we call also the capacity of a form of endlessness, um, is another part what, what is uh, laid over this idea of the large detail. As, as maybe I explained within the Möbius uh, house, whereby this notion of going from sleeping to working and living into one gesture is connected also to the four quadrants of the landscape in, 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 in its context. And maybe that's how you have to read also the residential project in Singapore. It constantly plays with the four quadrants of the location in its uh, context. Or the, 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 the trifold organization of the Mercedes-Benz Museum, whereby a, a condition of a play between you being on, on an infrastructural uh, experience moving around this museum, it, it's, it's, ex, it's almost as if you would not be able, as a, you would put in a pen onto the line, whereby you could not take uh, your pen off the line anymore, is, is a, a play we uh, introduce quite a lot in the work. Um, and it's actually maybe dealing with the idea of the double reading of, of, of again, that what I said about what, what we can understand of the images uh, we, we uh, uh, generate in, in architecture and can generate in architecture. Uh, for instance, in this loft um, in, in uh, New York, um, what we designed for an art collector who, uh, who after so many years, wanted to live with his uh, collection, uh, and, and I went with him to many hills and, and locations in order to find a, a house or a place for his collection and uh, a place where he could live. We found this, this exciting uh, loft in New York, uh, but, but I argued with him that the most important was the back uh, uh, element uh, of, the, of, the, of the project, where we could open the facade in an constant dynamic uh, painting whereby he would have of course his collection where he would move around uh, in when he would uh, uh, live and, and, and pre present the artworks within his apartment but but the view and the, and the frameworks of this view were as important for him as the collection itself Yeah, so the, the notion of duration and the way how maybe a form of 
treating a surface like, like a face whereby the black hole and the white ball of the face is not so easily recognizable anymore whereby maybe, maybe the, the black hole of the face, as we know it from the masquerade principle in architecture, is here an opening whereby you may be attracted in, in the building and whereby the surface can be turned and, and, and melted and bended in many directions and where the white wall is not to, as a, to be seen as a single surface anymore or the black hole not anymore seen as one opening, but many openings who can be uh, attracting you and directing you through the surfaces of the space. As in many projects lately, we, we, we like that idea of this looking up effect whereby you don't know where the surface is moving into a kind of light condition or where this space is maybe a chandelier-like space or if it is 20 stories high or 30 stories high. This kind of, kind of constant double reading of, of the space it's also a relationship to the way how we'd like to introduce a double reading towards the understanding of the program of the project. Like, like this is not, maybe you might think it is a department store alone, but it is not. There are many other programs to be found in this building. But of course, we, we, we flirted with the idea of a museum here. Yeah, we, we, we said that it would be nice that each product within the building would be uh, presented as an art piece. And would it not be great that that in a way, like maybe Andy Warhol also believed that that you know Andy Warhol said something like uh, funny that if when we all die we, we when we all die we will end up in uh, Bloomingdale's, um, but maybe this kind of made in heaven effect of of a world of shininess and of uh, uh, pro products where where you can maybe play with within a, a world where especially in Asia this is in Korea. Uh, where a department store is a much more important public space than a place where you eye shop or sh really shop. So this idea of, of the world being played around with whereby you don't know if it is a public space alone or a, de a department store where you have also a gallery and, and, a, and a cinema, uh, um, many, many restaurants, etc. is, is uh, here at stake. And maybe the double reading is also to be found in the facade, whereby almost a kind of moray effect is introduced, where you don't know if there is a texture to be seen in the facade, what is having depth, or if it is only a single, straight, double surface. Well, you're moving around the building, you suddenly discover the, 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 the depth of the facade. But, but if, if I talk about that principle of the looking up effects and, and the double readings of the void spaces and, and, and this double understanding of a program, then, then similarly it is connected to a, a quality of an experience like I explained here in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the pavilion. Maybe this pavilion refers to many histories of uh, Chicago, but at the same time it is an object by it on its own and it's a place with an, an, an other type of public construct uh, than what you can find within the city. Similarly, maybe like in a house like this in, in, the, in, in Stuttgart, whereby this double experience of walking around the site and walking around within the building, you come into a condition where it's almost like if you, you go through a parallax experience, like, so, like sorry, like the landscape uh, 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 in the surroundings of, of the project is mirrored back into the house itself as well. Um, so this double reading of this parallax experience is to be found only there where you have gone the, through the two experiences, the landscape and the house itself. And if you come in a house and you take the staircase, then you uh, might uh, have then this view uh, from the center uh, towards the top of the hill. And, uh, and, and then suddenly, as almost the, the building opens as an eye, uh, you might see the full uh, scope of the landscape. <laughs> so as I talked about the knowledge uh, uh, and, and, and the exchange of knowledge, and maybe, maybe on the one hand side, maybe I contradict myself by talking so much about cultural references. 
uh, you know, if I if I think about the other side of the development of the work, whereby the harder information comes together of, like, you know, this 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 smoke detector system in the Mercedes-Benz Museum, then I lately I'm so fascinated in this harder a scientific side of the profession as well, and and we do everything to become smarter and and much more efficient and, and, and more critical and innovative in the same time uh, around this topic in order to make projects like this happen. And i tell you why, because this smoke detector system is not an invention introduced by myself alone. It was a in highly intense discussion between several engineers and the city department in order to make sure that if we would have a fire, that the smoke would be sucked out of the building in almost five minutes. So that may means that um, that we didn't have to compartmentalize uh, the building with fire compartments. So we could reduce within the project almost 15% of the materials of the building. We could reduce down almost 10% of the cost of the project. So with this, uh, we were able to do a building that was far more open and far more transparent than, than, uh, than in the beginning we had planned. The building otherwise would have everywhere class uh, elements to be produced and, and would in a way close off the building uh, intensely. So, so an innovation like this makes this possible, that's <coughs> what I'm trying to argue for. It's almost the invisible aspect of the way how these different levels of technological innovation is necessary to do a project like this. Or the way how uh, concrete core activation was introduced also in now in most of our buildings lately. We only heat up with that for three hours, as you know, maybe all for three hours the building and, and for the rest, you, or you can cool it down for maybe four hours and then for the rest of the day it stays cool or warm. Um, so how can we introduce with new technological uh, innovation, new production techniques, as we know now with new forms of computational techniques, how can we introduce new forms of you know, larger details who can do so much more than we ever thought uh, was possible? So it's not here that, that, that I've ever thought that it was possible and necessary to promote complexity in architecture alone. I'm even trying here to argue for another form of discipline in the way how we can make and an, 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 an richness of a complexity possible in architecture, whereby if you move through the project, that you suddenly notice how calm the work is. You know, and this idea of calmness is only possible if you repeat certain elements. It's only like you can find in music, especially in the work of Philip Glass, for instance. If you repeat certain elements, like in the Möbius house, we had only three types of degrees. Seven degrees, nine degrees, and eleven degrees. And these angles, Whenever you see the project, are quite complex. But if you move through the project, you suddenly discover a kind of form of new calmness and kind of form of serenity, what is uh, then coming over you. And that is exactly what what uh, what what is happening in the museum. It seems to be highly complex, but if you come into the project, and suddenly you discover that it is very calm. So this play between the the the, uh, the managing of the organization of this complexity is far more important than than we sometimes think when we produce complexity. It needs to be controlled, is my argument. So in this case, uh, like the twist elements, they, there are only four twist elements who carry all the cantilevers within the project. And they make it possible to, to uh, then uh, cantilever out over these twisted columns, you could say, almost over uh, 33 meters. And that's why this void space ha has or does has these incredible deep uh, textures, so not only to be found on the edge of the void, but if you stand opposite the void, then you can also deeply look into it. So, so maybe through a kind of form of mechanical objectivity, as I like to call it, we, we constantly test these ideas and then try to find ways to discipline them. And, and maybe in a way also try then uh, uh, to discover how we can increase the different scales of participation and whereby, in a way, um, the different levels of participation create new forms of control, not alone, but that by that we can stretch even further the quality of the profession and the way how we can bring all our knowledge we'd like to still uh, discover 
uh, into, the, uh, to, into the work. This was one of our earlier parametric uh, uh, diagrams uh, in, in the mid-90s, whereby we argued for how user groups, time, different programmatic entities could be placed in a location <coughs> so that we could discover how accessibility and publicness could come together in a location like this. But, but lately we have learned that, that these invisible infrastructural planning and time issues in the way how we organize our projects are not the only parameters we, we need to work with. But it is this complexity of the physical knowledge and the, and the virtual knowledge what we try to bring into another kind of order. Whereby maybe the closed aspect of the cooperative uh, towards maybe the collaborative principle of designing is slowly, in, in our case, now moving towards a co-creative uh, uh, series of principles. Um, and maybe whereby closed innovation is turned into other forms of uh, open innovation. I'd like to keep it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Can I open the floor to questions? They're always going to ask me to ask the first one, so I'll do that. Um, and there, there are a couple of points, actually, that come out of a, a great kind of survey, of, uh, particularly the sort of what you feel like is the latest almost phase or iteration of a project that's been unfolding over many years. And, one is the idea of the prototype, which, interestingly, your diagram is almost in the center of everything. And I'm wondering if you might say something about the kinds of prototypes that have emerged in the studio, particularly in recent years. Some of them seem to be sort of sample, one-to-one -one pieces of things like the museum. You referred, interestingly, to the pavilion almost as a prototype of its own for certain kinds of projects. But I'm wondering if that, if that space of the prototype extends even beyond these kind of models or if there are things that are happening within the studio now that might be emerging as ways of working on things that are at the scale of products, product design or installations or something or if, as I think you've argued in the past, that at times almost images can become a kind of prototype mm. for possible projects. Yeah, <clears throat> but you're right that, um, I mean, the Prototypes now change. They, they we, we would. I mean, as we all know, the history of the diagram. The, the diagram came in into the 90s, the mid 90s, because we discovered that it was not so interesting anymore to to draw alone. So would it not be fascinating to use a diagram in order in the experiment in order to give you non-reductive information? that it give, would, in all case, diagrams would be infrastructural maps. It would give you direction. It would give you a new type of order. It would be introduced in the middle of the design process where suddenly it would give you another insight than coming up with ideas. So, so diagrams were, in a way, uh, very helpful to, um, to give them pro ideas for proto-functionality in architecture. And, and if, if one can maybe fully understand that principle, because you know the proto-functional is interesting. The proto-functional is maybe dealing with the idea that you don't have yet an organization yet or for your project, but it is somewhere to be found in something that is going beyond your sketch or something that is in your imagination, but what falls in just into the, into the design process. And that's how we use prototypes too. So, so um, Sometimes it might be um, like where maybe I talk about now quite a lot and uh, you know this principle of <coughs> larger detail, they become also in a way prototypes. It, and, and like the, the, the managing of the void, and you know that maybe in our work there are many, many tests we have done with many types of voids, like I showed maybe two or three, two tonight. Uh, one in the department store <coughs> and one in the Mercedes-Benz Museum. But I see that also in a way a pr as a prototype because they become a serial element within the project that moves from one project to the other. 
And I think this, this is actually in a way not done in architecture. You cannot say to a client, I'm going to do the same void as, or maybe something like that, because that's what often clients say <laughs> to you. You know, I like to have a project like that. But I do, I, I do like it that, that, for instance, in art, it's very, it's very normative to, to use serial strategies. You know, you can easily uh, do uh, a series of paintings, and then maybe a series of paintings are, doing, are, are the work. But that's not allowed in architecture. And I like that idea that, that things can move over from one project to the other and be tested as prototypes without telling anyone that that is yeah. in the work, you know? I mean, that's the other thing that, looking at the work tonight as you presented, of course, your idea of the prototype is traveling across a catalog of work that's interestingly, increasingly organized <laughs> around types. Mm. Let's say the department store, the house, the bridge, the museum, like the iconic European building types of the 19th century almost, and the types that in fact modern architecture emerges out of. It seems it's a term for you that is also a way to negotiate that catalog so that ideas can move across those otherwise discrete, separate episodes in the studio. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, in a way I'm saying, you know, don't see the typological entity of a program as singular. Mm -hmm. I, you know, for instance, sure. if you really study the museum, uh, then it is more reference also to the to the the bridges and the tunnels of Slyg and Leonard to be found in, in Stuttgart, you know, that like it is maybe a, one infrastructural element. It, it's not a building, it's infrastructure. Questions? Yeah. Very quick related question to first Brad's question. Um, and it's regarding the methodology that the studios have been developing over the course of the years. So one way to maybe phrase that question, in your early work, in your early writings, you um, almost define these two directions of how diagram and form can relate to one another. On one hand, you spoke about this relationship between a diagram, then design model, then a prototype, and then a kind of a scaled prototype, which is maybe a st more structural one, which suggested that there may be a movement from a functional diagram to a some, something in between, which is a design model, which is much more applied a materialized um, version. On the other hand, you spoke of this part of functional direction where um, we can dismiss with the diagram always coming from a functional programmatic side affecting program and rather the form becomes the kind of infrastructure that then uh, inscribes the programmatic mm. logic. Is, is, is that in a way, um, in, and, and also there were always observations that you made in, in with regards to several projects that there's always a much softer understanding between a kind of a, um, a uh, inspiration diagram or an incoming set of design models and how they become then built. So there's always a lot of movement. And I think there's something that you're suggesting today in a series of unraveling spirals, kind of uh, getting a, uh, doing away with this kind of hierarchical understanding of the design process. Is that something where we can in a way learn that there may be another set of um, graphs of being bidirectional or somehow parallel in our tracks and it would be really interesting to hear your um, opinion how you see it mm. the, the work emerging today I like that you talk about the softer interpretation of the diagram because uh, you know that that is uh, that's in a way how one needs to learn to design you know if you translate from a drawing towards a built form you need to know how you instrumentalize, for instance, an, 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 a suggestive diagram, in, you know, again, into a built form. So, you know, there has been, of course, in the, in the period when, when everyone talked about diagrams, there was always a dialogue about, yeah, what about the built diagram? You know, can you build a diagram? I have always uh, been highly against it. Uh, because if you think about the representational effect of, of, of the way how you translate a diagram, that you know that will never generate, for instance, that idea of an after image, or a, a much more richer layer, layering of the, the the way how you can adapt uh, more ingredients you can bring towards the translation of the diagram. So I've much more I've always been much more interested in the way how you instrumentalize the diagram, and that's what so I like that idea that you talk about the softer interpretation because that, that is maybe a way how artists again would, or scientists in the experiments would often work, you know, so they would first soften their processes up to many kind of other channels and roads they take in order to discover. Um, 
not to develop a kind of over-eager urgency to solve the problem tomorrow. I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of, of, of the soft inter, uh, instrumental quality of the way how you translate um, the way what, that what we can find in that was not yet functional. But, 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 but I hope that I explain the, the richness of it because that's the most important, the richer and the, and the more intenser the better. Double reading uh, effect. So you are using it uh, in many projects, and uh, I guess uh, it has an origin from postmodernism uh, when it was firstly, I guess, described by, by Charles Jenks in his uh, book about this double reading in postmodernist projects. So I'm wondering why did you pick up this idea, but not something like something else, like what is arising from uh, these years, like due to technological advancements and due to society changes and things like that. Why double reading? Um, it's, you know, I'm not uh, promoting double reading in architecture. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm not, not interested in double reading alone. I, I, I am actually fascinated in the way how if we, if we talk about uh, uh, contemporary questions, then today, of course, I mean, if, if, we, if we understand uh, politics today well, then, then hopefully they're not single image anymore, as you know. I mean, today, uh, culture is highly complex. If we can today talk about uh, so many different ways of how, how yeah, even, even product design becomes somewhere now also art, you know, I mean, it's product design is much more presented lately in museums than ever before. Then, then, then I, I think a lot about the way how cultural effects can be applied to to the way how we produce also architecture. So it's it's it it goes hand in hand together with technological in a, a with uh, sorry with technological innovation in the same time. It's not so that I promote double double readings alone. It's it's more about experiences, you know. Double double understandings is sounding like a kind of a twofold principle. I'm I'm talking more about a, about a much more kaleidoscopic quality of architecture. I, I love the way that your, the program drives your your, your projects right very through from the double meetings to the very kind of solar purpose that, that appears in them um, and particularly maybe in, in Galleria where you start to see the, the influence of culture on, on commerce in, in quite an extraordinary way and I was very interested in your point about the influence of you know of the museum being a place to, to display objects and, and retail and wondered if you would expand upon that that point um. yeah I, I that's uh, that's nice that you say that but I mean it is actually so for me that, uh, you know, I mean, what I said about Andy Wall is actually an, an honest uh, fascination, you know, that he had that interest always in this kind of world of shopping, or someone like Jeff Koons, that he played constant, always in his work, with colors and reflectiveness. Well, you know, his ideas of reflectiveness is dealing with the idea of the reflectiveness of society today and what it is, what attracts us, what, what is it? really what attracts us. Why are we fascinated in uh, the principles of the way how we'd like to collect stuff? You know, why do we collect all that stuff in our homes? You know, why, why, why is that our, in our culture? Why do we know everything about brands? It's kind of amazing if I hear someone sometimes talking about what they know about brands. It's like if we know more about brands than politics today. So it's, it's, it's fascinating that that, that that world is not fully uh, embraced in architecture, you know? Why, why is it dirty to do a commercial building, they always ask me. You know, why, you, you should, why do you do a department store? And then I say, well, you know, you should study it first. Questions? Sorry, there's one back here.
Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us today. Uh, actually, my question is towards, some, towards something you showed to us as being very important to you, the sharing of knowledge and open source. And maybe architecture is always a bit late in some respect to the game. So for example, Jeremy Lanier, he's the founder of open source. He wrote the license for GNU and Linux. Tell us how wrong they were because as knowledge becomes widely and easily available, the purpose of new knowledge creation kind of fades out. And that is kind of true. Linux evolved to a point where it was formidable, but it stuck there, where Windows and OS X evolved. And how will you deal with this kind of challenge when it comes to knowledge in architecture? I, I hope I talked about it. <coughs> I. I <clears throat> I believe that uh, that today that there is so much interesting knowledge available uh, and, and we know it uh, from our phone, we open it and we suddenly can get almost every information we like. Uh, so I think this world of going out, what you see in so many other disciplines, why, why should architects not follow that principles? Uh, why should we not very carefully start to collaborate with with other disciplines, for instance, I, I, um, I learned lately a lot from startup companies, enormously. You know how they set up their model of working, how they are collaborating on many different parts of the world. Uh, often they don't work in one space anymore; they, they they work half at home. There are many ways we can learn from the way how how, how we can not only purely outsource information or like what I said also about uh, collect information from the online world, but there is there a world we have to recognize in architecture and, and try to communicate much better with. You know, you're right. I cannot hear you. Can, can you speak up a little bit more? Hello. Yes. yes. <laughs> you mentioned Singapore and the uh, very uh, strict or uh, regulations, and I'm kind of curious as to what was the most challenging one and how you dealt with that. Um, I don't know if you know. Do you know Singapore actually? Yes, a bit. Yeah, because it's actually one of the most <coughs> unbelievable cities where regulations are planned with the most uh, well-advanced, uh, well-organized city planning, planning department you can imagine. Uh, it's like, it's the URI, it's called, you probably know them. They have thousands and thousands of people working there and they, they, they're not controlling the, the infrastructure or the landscape of the city purely alone, but they, they're really open for dialogue. And for instance, uh, here, the, the request of uh, bringing in um, um, the landscape within the project, for instance, was, was one of the, the latest requirements that came in only since the last three, four years as, as something what, what, uh, or what this, yeah, where the city is standing for. So all these open spaces, the way how the air could flow through the building, the, what I said about the ground floor, how it can be, or how it had to be lifted up, actually. The ground floor had to be lifted up. So the first seven floors, they don't have any problem so that all the landscape can, and the open spaces can be part of the whole uh, building, are part of the city's uh, planning uh, strategies. But, but I don't mind so much uh, all these regulations because, you know, I'm Dutch. In Holland, we have so many kind of regulations. You cannot imagine; it's the most bureaucratic place on the one end in the world. So, so I, I, I see it always as a challenge more than something else of a restriction. <laughs> right, we're going to stop there, Ben. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for coming back. <laughs>